Hi, this is Dr. John Bergs from Franciscan University of Steubenville and the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, coming to you on the National Day of Prayer for the Legal Protection of Unborn Children. This is usually the day of the March for Life. However, this year, with the presidential inauguration going on this week and all of the complications involved with that, uh, the March for Life is actually going to be next Friday. But nonetheless, this is still the designated day of prayer for the protection of unborn children. So we want to pray for that intention today. And the readings are uh, those of Friday of the second week of Ordinary Time. And we are continuing in our um, journey through the Epistle to the Hebrews. And I will try to uh, abbreviate this first reading, which is a bit lengthy. It goes, Brothers and sisters, now our high priest has obtained so much more excellent a ministry as he is mediator of a better covenant enacted on better promises. Let me stop just there and reiterate that as we're working through the epistle to the Hebrews, the constant theme is how Jesus is better than all the mediators uh, of the Old Testament, all the covenant mediators. There are different mediatorial figures. Uh, a mediator is a go-between. So there's different mediatorial figures in the Old Testament who um, mediated between the people of God and God himself. Figures like Moses, Joshua, the angels for, uh, do a mediatorial role, perform a mediatorial role. Uh, and others. And, and in a particular way, the high priest was kind of like the standing mediator between the people of Israel and God. But Jesus is greater than the high priest. Why? Well, you know, the high priest administered the Mosaic covenant, but Jesus administers the new covenant, which is much superior. That's the principle here. And now the author of Hebrews goes back into the old covenant and points out that the Old Testament itself indicated that the Mosaic Covenant, we also call it sometimes the Sinai Covenant, was flawed and would eventually be replaced. And in fact, there's a very significant passage, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, where Jeremiah prophesied that a new covenant would come and replace the covenant of Moses, the covenant that Moses made. And here in Hebrews 8, our author quotes uh, this whole oracle from Jeremiah. It's the longest quotation of the Old Testament in the New Testament anywhere. Okay, so a little bit of trivia there for you. If ever you ask, what's the longest passage quoted from the Old Testament that you find in the New Testament? It's here in Hebrews 8. We're just quoting from Jeremiah 31. For if that first covenant had been faultless, the author says, no place would have been sought for a second one. But he, meaning God, finds fault with them and says, and here he's quoting now from Jeremiah 31, beginning in verse 31, going through verse 34. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will conclude a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their fathers, the day that I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt, for they did not stand by my covenant, and I ignored them, says the Lord. Okay. Now, what is this covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them forth from the land of Egypt? That is obviously the Mosaic or Sinai covenant. Okay. And so this new covenant is not going to be like that covenant, which uh, which they uh, the people of Israel didn't abide by, and, uh, and so that disrupted the relationship between them and the Lord. But, our text says, this is the covenant I will establish with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and write them upon their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. This phrase, I will be their God and they shall be my people, this is a modification of the ancient Israelite wedding ceremony during which the groom would say at kind of the high point of the ceremony, I will be your husband and you shall be my wife. He would solemnly state the relationship that was being formed by the wedding ceremony. And that's modified in several places of scripture 
and and God says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. That's like a it's like a nuptial covenantal relationship, like husband and wife. Um, and it continues, and they shall not teach each one his fellow citizen and kin, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least to the greatest, for I'll forgive their evil doing and remember their sins no more. Okay. Now, what is the sense of our first reading? Uh, the basic sense of it is this. The author is saying, the Old Testament itself predicts that Moses' covenant, which we typically refer to as the Old Covenant, will be retired and a new one will replace it. And the key passage that predicts this is found in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34, in which we just uh, read there. Okay, So there, the prophet Jeremiah predicts the coming of a new and better covenant. This brings up an important point that I want to emphasize. We are not Catholic Christians because we have discarded the Old Testament and we don't believe the Old Testament. No. We are Catholic Christians because we believe the Old Testament. We believe all that the Old Testament says is true. And we believe that the Old Testament predicted Jesus and Jesus' new covenant. And the, Jesus brought the new covenant, which the Old Testament had said would happen and would come. So we believe in the fulfillment of the Old Testament. That's why it's still in our Bibles and we revere it as sacred scripture, and we say the word of the Lord, thanks be to God, okay, when we read from it, okay, not because we disbelieve. I think that's a common misconception. A lot of Christians go around like, well, we've discarded the Old Testament. We're New Testament Christians. Like, no, we have not discarded it. We treasure it, we believe it, and we believe it's been fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. So that's one point <clears throat> that I'd like to make. Another point is, this passage from Jeremiah, when he says, I will put my laws in their minds and write them upon their hearts, this is referring to the gift of the Holy Spirit, which internalizes God's law. The Spirit comes to live within us, and then the Spirit guides our actions moment by moment to do what Jesus wants us to do every moment throughout the day. And that's the internalization of God's law. We don't have to read God's law in a book. It's in our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. And that's also what's being referred to when Jeremiah says, They shall not teach each one his fellow citizen and kin, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least and greatest. Jeremiah doesn't mean that there's no role for catechesis in the church anymore. No, Jeremiah is using the term know uh, to refer to the relationship of husband and wife. Um, that's one of the ways that the Hebrew word know was employed. For example, it'll say things like, Adam knew Eve and she conceived, and it refers to this intimate union between husband and wife where they embrace and come to know each other and experience each other in a bond of love. And so um, Jeremiah is using th that term know in a sense of interpersonal covenantal intimacy, uh, that we will know God like spouses know each other. And that, too, is referring to the gift of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit enters into us and allows us to participate in the divine nature. And we come, we, we are filled with love in, in a way analogous to, again, how spouses embrace one another, become one flesh with each other. So God becomes one with us through the Holy Spirit. And uh, we are transformed and we are united to God in love and we experience God personally. You know, we come to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Yes and amen. You know, we, we evangelical Protestants often use that terminology, but it, it uh, is perfectly good terminology because it describes the relationship that Christians have with Jesus and all of the saints had a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And you see it reflected in their writings, St. Therese, uh, Lisieux, uh, um, you know, St. Augustine, all of these great works that they left us talk about the intimacy of their relationship with God through Jesus Christ. So those are some things that are going on in the first reading. Let's go to uh, Mark's uh, reading. I love this passage from Mark, Mark 3, 13 through 19. So glad I got this one. 
to comment on. Jesus went up the mountain and summoned those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, that they might what? That they might what? Okay. Now listen carefully, because he's going to give three aspects of discipleship here, which are perennially important and also apply to us. Okay. He chose these 12. Why? First of all, so that they might be with him. Okay, that's the first thing. And that he might send them forth to preach. That's the second thing. And to have authority to drive out demons. Okay. Now, the first thing a disciple does is just be with Jesus. And that applies to each one of us. We're first called to just be with the Lord. This refers to our communion with the Lord, our relationship. Just like that, that indwelling Holy Spirit that we talked about from the first reading. Okay. We, how do we be with Jesus? How do we hang with the Lord? Okay, well, through prayer, that intimacy and prayer, through the sacraments, like intimacy through taking him on our tongue and communion, experience him in the other sacraments, okay, through adoration, you know, these times. And then, and that doesn't mean, oh, we're not with the Lord through the rest of the day, but through prayer and the sacraments and adoration, we cultivate this relationship that then continues throughout the day, even in our daily tasks and our duties of state and the changing the diapers and the paying bills and, and being in the cubicle and whatever. And, uh, and so that we, we remain in the Lord. We, we live in his presence moment by moment throughout the day. That's being with the Lord. That's the first call of a disciple is just to have that intimate relationship with him. Then secondly, to preach, that refers to evangelism. And then the casting out of demons is reflected in, in the life of the church, really through the sacramental ministry, because uh, the sacraments are the front lines of the fight against the demonic. And many of the sacraments have an exorcistic dimension to them. For example, baptism is exorcistic and has a mini, a mini rite of exorcism in it. Um, Confession is definitely exorcistic, definitely drives out demons. Uh, you know, we practiced a form of non-sacramental confession in Protestant deliverance ministry. When I was a Protestant pastor, we had people confess sins audibly in the presence of other Christians as a form of exorcism. And then later I realized that the confessional and the Catholic sacrament of reconciliation was a form of exorcism. I'd have to make some technical uh, terminological distinctions, but just I'm speaking kind of colloquially here, so uh, allow me a little bit of uh, imprecision in, in my use of terms there. But uh, 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 what I mean is the, the sacrament of reconciliation frees us from demonic uh, bondage. And so uh, those who are in holy orders kind of have a fullness of this discipleship, you know, priests and, and especially bishops and so on. They're called to a life of prayer where they preach and they drive out demons through the sacramental ministry and, and also uh, uh, not just the sacraments, but also sacramentals like, you know, the rite of exorcism and others. And then it lists the 12 apostles. So those are fundamental pillars of discipleship, being with the Lord, doing evangelism, telling others about Jesus, and then for lay people, inviting others to the sacraments and for uh, the clergy uh, celebrating the sacraments. And now since it's the day of prayer for the um, uh, legal protection of the unborn, I want to focus on that demonic because one of the manifestations of the demonic in our society is abortion. I am an Old Testament scholar, and time and again, the Old Testament prophets rebuked the people of Israel for worshiping the Lord at, in the temple and then turning around and worshiping uh, other gods, the gods of the nations, or the gods of Den to the Gentiles, which were really demons, by the way, Baal and Chemosh and Molech, these other pagan gods. Um, that are mentioned in the Old Testament, really what they were were demons, and many of them demanded child sacrifice. And not only the nations around Israel worshipped these gods by sacrificing their children to these gods, but even the Israelites were sucked into this, and they would worship God in the temple one day and turn around and uh, sacrifice uh, 
uh, their children uh, to these demons. And I am convinced that the modern practice of abortion is just the unholy resurrection of this ancient pagan practice of worshiping demons through this, the bloody sacrifice of children. And we have this going on, and basically what we're doing in this country and in many countries is literally sacrificing millions of our children each year on the altar of our gods of uh, prosperity and pleasure, okay? And those are always the, the, the primary gods. Back in, in ancient times, Baal was the god of prosperity and Asherah was the god of pleasure. She was the, the Venus god, the god of, uh, in particular, sexual pleasure. And so in this country and in many others, we, have, we practice deranged sexuality. We don't practice sexuality within marriage. We fornicate. Um, we conceive children out of wedlock, which is never God's intention. God's intention was always that each child would come into the world with a father and a mother who were committed to the child and to each other. It's an unbreakable triad. I'm committed to your mother and I'm committed to you, my child. I'm committed to your father and I'm committed to you, my son. Okay, that, that's the model. That is the model of the Trinity. And that is God's intention. And we don't follow that. We fornicate. We conceive children out of wedlock. And then we offer them on the, on the altar of the gods of, uh, of, of pleasure and prosperity for the sake of, oh, that I can have a comfortable life. You know, a kid is going to drag me down, is going to derail my plans for my life. And so uh, I'm going to get rid of my problem, as Pope Francis says, by calling in a hitman. That's how Pope Francis uh, describes um, uh, abortion as a kind of assassination. Now, the, the, you know, uh, we want to have compassion on all who are sucked into this practice, who are told lies and told that it's a good thing and so on. And many people get sucked into that and, and then regret it. And it's a great tragedy. But in the bigger picture, it is just an objective evil and it is a worship of the demonic. And we need to pray uh, about this, and uh, it should become an unacceptable thing in our political and social cultural. Uh, thanks be to God, racism and uttering racial slurs have become completely unacceptable in our society such that if somebody gets up in public and utters racial slurs, their political career is over, okay? That person is not going to hold uh, public office. We just don't tolerate that. Uh, I uh, hope and pray that the day comes when a politician gets up and says, I believe that the killing of unborn human children should be legal. We would say, sorry, that's it. Okay, your career is over. We are just not going to consider you for public office. That's how it should be because the evil of abortion is such an offense to God, it deranges society and, and ruins, kills millions of lives and ruins millions of other lives. So let's pray for the power of the Lord Jesus Christ, the God-man, to overcome the powers of evil in our society, which are only here because we consent to them and we keep inviting them in our decisions, but at, let's ask the Lord to fill us with this Holy Spirit to drive out this evil from ourselves and from society on this day, uh, because he is the king forever, uh, especially on this day when we read about him setting up his 12 princes over his kingdom, as we see in Mark 3. So this has been Dr. John Bergsma from the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology and Franciscan University of Steubenville. Coming to you on this day of prayer for the legal protection of unborn children, which falls on the second, the Friday, I should say, of the second week of ordinary time. Till next time, God bless you richly.